Everybody got to spend time with their family today. Uh, I know I'm with my family in Oklahoma, uh, Dan, Ricky, and Chasta, and I've had a fantastic day. One thing I'd like to say about it before I drop it, people, please, I hope y'all know that Easter is not about a big Easter rabbit that brings eggs to little kids. But don't forget what today really is all about. It's about the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Other than that... Uh, we want to turn everything over to my co-host, which is uh, the Lady Outlaw, Miss Shasta. Uh, before I get into that one, though, uh, Kelly's had to uh, do the Easter deal with her in-laws tonight, so she will not be here. So, you know, that's not really no big deal because of the fact that we've got our other regular co-host coming on the show tonight. Uh, before I get to her, though, Love to tell you a funny little incident that happened to her this week. She was bitten by a brown recluse spider. And she has been to the doctor and taken antibiotics and uh, cortisone and steroids and all that, and it is doing great. But she is milking that pitiful little bite for all it is worth. She's walking around with her britches leg pulled up to her knee, wanting everybody to look at my spider bite. Everybody look at my spider bite. I'm sick of looking at her spider bite. <laughs> I'm glad Dan is around. <laughs> Are you there, Shasta? <laughs> yes, I am. And, I mean, good grief, you can't blame me for milking it and getting all the attention I can from it. That's what us females, some of us do. And, hey, it was a great opportunity. You don't pass up opportunities. And I'd like to say hello to everyone out in the chat. And, I hope y'all are here and ready to rock and roll and have a good time, because I show sure am. And I would also like to take this time right here to introduce our other outlaw, our own Ghosty. And I'd like to thank Creek for that one. How you doing, Ghosty? Yeah, I'm doing all right. <laughs> well, tell us what you've been doing today. Today I have been laying around the house, being lazy, slept till 2 o'clock this afternoon, uh, watched the rain pour all day, so I, I knew I wasn't going to get to work in the yard, so I took advantage and uh, caught up on some much-needed rest. Well, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I think we all could use some rest. I know it's been hectic here. Even uh, the spider bite hadn't kept me down a bit. There's just no time for it. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, we had went to... Fort Seal the other day and got to really check out the Fort Seal Army Post, which is a very beautiful post, chock full of history, my gosh. And we got to go and visit Quanta Parker's grave and Geronimo's grave. And uh, Actually, we had a funny thing about that going on because uh, Bear, we let Bear drive, and y'all know how this can be, some of y'all. <laughs> and we had ended up... We had to go a back way that supposedly this guy had told him about, and here's the big red signs over this bridge saying, danger, warning, do not enter, or this is the warrior zone, and yes, we drive right into that area and across the bridge. Dan was even getting nervous on that one. We're actually expecting to get shells landed on us, but we did make it to the Apache Cemetery. <laughs> Well, you know, they did have a few signs out there say, uh, be prepared for shells to pass over your head. And uh, Dan was cringing in the back seat, and Shasta was over there, uh, Bear, are we supposed to go this way? Are we go I said, y'all just calm down. We're going to find Geronimo's grave, and then we're going to leave. <laughs> and Dan said, well, 
well, I'm just worried about the shells that's going to be coming over. I said, look, just remember, Dan, the shell that hit you, you never hear. So don't worry about it, son. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and we did make it home safe and sound, as you all all can see. But um, to kind of get into what we're going to be doing tonight, uh, Chad here has something special lined up for everyone. And um, so I'm going to turn it over to him and let him take it from there. I uh, wanted to take a little bit of time tonight and kind of honor a former research partner. He was more than that. He was my uncle. Uh, we were more like brothers than uncle and nephew. But uh, he passed here recently, passed on the 10th of February, I believe. And uh, I just want to take a few minutes tonight kind of talk about the research we did and let everybody know that the community did lose something when he passed. It wasn't just our family that lost something. It was the Bigfoot community, too. Yes, he was. I had actually gotten to meet Richard once down at an outing at Sulphur, and he was a wonderful person. He was a, had a wonderful personality, always had a smile on his face, and would, you, he just kept you laughing all the time. He, he was uh, a lot of fun to be around, uh, seemed to have a very wonderful spirit about him, and I didn't get to know him real well, but I did get to meet him, and uh, we did get to, you know, do some uh, observing with him, and he, he really was just a, real, a wonderful person. He really was. Chad, uh, wasn't your uncle at first, when y'all started uh, going out together looking for boogers and things, he, he he didn't think that nothing like this existed. Am I correct? Correct. Um, when I told him, see, I had my initial sighting in 96, but I didn't tell anybody until 2000 or so. And uh, that's when I joined a research group in Texas. Well, once I started with that group, I started researching a lot more, spending a lot more time out away from him but he saw that as a as a way for us to spend time together instead of being apart so he pretended to be interested in it so that we could hang out <laughs> he pretended, <huh? laughs> he, pretended <huh? laughs> he uh he actually thought i was full of it he, he thought i'd done <laughs> lost my mind joined some crazy cult out of texas and uh <laughs> anyway we uh we would just do our usual thing, hanging out, but we did it in the woods now instead of just riding around town or whatever. We would go out. Uh, he was kind of limited on what he could do because of his size. Richard was, he was about 6'5", and he, he weighed almost 600 pounds. Right. But he, uh, he, he also didn't let that, limit him the way it does most people of that size he uh he wasn't going to be one of those people that they had to cut the wall off the side of the house and drag him out on jerry springer or something you know he uh right right he went to the store every every time they needed groceries he uh he he had a full-time job he worked at the the school for the deaf for years and then worked as a dispatcher for a police department for a long time but uh, he didn't let his size be too much of a hindrance for him. But when it come to research, he wasn't able to go trekking off into the woods for miles like I did. Right. So when he and I would go, would go out, we'd go in his van to some pretty good spots, and then we'd make calls or whatever and try to drum up some interest from the the big guys out in the woods. Yeah, you was trying to help him out a lot by bringing them closer to him. I, I can understand that. And, uh, I mean, it's not often that you get people that you're close to and that you uh, grew up with and know and love uh, interested in a subject that, heck, 99.9% uh, .9 of the country don't even believe exists. And uh, it, it, a lot of people don't understand how hard that is. But uh, until they've been placed into that position, you know, 
uh, actually revealing to somebody that's really close to you what your hobby is, because that's all it is with us is a hobby. I mean, we none of us have any credentials to justify what we're doing anyway. And uh, But it, it's really hard to try to come across without being made uh, <clears throat> fun of and uh, people spouting negative things in your face and laughing at you because that's the last thing you want to do is cause a brawl over, quote, in their eyes, an uh, imaginary mystical animal. Right. He was uh, he was good about not giving me too much uh, flack over it, cause uh, he knew I had dirt on him. So if he made fun of me, he had a couple <laughs> barrels loaded on him, you know. But uh, hey, I never yeah. thought of it from that angle. I'm gonna have to start <laughs> digging up dirt on people close to me so they can't uh, hold it over my head like a noose. <laughs> He uh, he become a believer real quick though once he had his first encounter, and it, it really it, it was his second encounter that made him a believer. His first one was really short, and uh, he thought, well, it could have been anything. We were up on a uh, on a ledge. I was up on the ledge. He was down in the van, and uh, there were some some cedar trees around. And while I was looking for tracks and stuff up on this this ledge, I got my hat knocked off of my head with a rock. Well, my first reaction was Richard's being a jerk and done throwing something at me because <laughs> that's the kind of relationship we had. Uh, so I look over at the van, and he's kind of got this confused look on his face, and he's looking back at me. And I went down to the van to see what was going on. And uh, he said, about the time my hat flew off, he kind of scanned the area to see what what might have made my hat fall off. And he said, one of the cedar trees that was up there wasn't up there no more. <laughs> the cedar tree took the own legs and commenced to walk it. <laughs> Was this, was, up there, uh, was this up there where we had went that time on the hill? This was, on, this was up at uh, Veterans Lake there in Sulphur, but it was around on the uh, the east side of the lake where the trails start. Okay. Don't you all have some pictures that you all can send the uh, yeah. audience in the chat room to so they can look at these pictures you know, I, while we're discussing this? I most certainly do. Let me get this up, and you all can go and uh, check out the pictures of this area. It's one of my favorite areas. I love sulfur. It is just very beautiful. Sulfur, Oklahoma. Uh, right. Uh, I, I wanted to put the Oklahoma part in there. I didn't know. If everybody, anybody, you know, everybody's not uh, conducive to the fact that we all, uh, where we at, it's easy for us to mention the names of these places because we're on a first name basis with them, and we automatically know what state they're in. But a lot of our listeners don't know. But uh, this is Sulphur, Oklahoma. Very a lot beautiful, of times, unique place. A lot of times when I've mentioned Sulphur, people automatically think, well, Sulphur Springs, Texas. No, right. it's a whole other animal. It's sulfur, Oklahoma. And how this long have you the, uh, researched there? I uh, I moved there in 95 from Fort Worth, Texas. But I didn't start researching until the following year when I had my first sighting uh, there in the park. So 96. Wow. How old was you then, Chad? Uh, a lot younger than I am now. <laughs> well, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was uh, 22 or so, 22 or 3. Right, right. Uh, you, but your interest, not in the subject of Bigfoot, but uh, was in the subject of nature and outdoors had been... Uh, you had been investing a lot of time in that way before you actually applied all this toward booger hunting, am I correct? Correct. See, uh, my, uh, my grandfather was Cherokee and Mississippi Choctaw and a whole lot of other stuff. 
But uh, he, uh, <laughs> what do he call you? A Heinz Fifty Seven, huh? You got a I, bunch I'm of a, flavors in you. <laughs> I'm a mutt baby. But uh, <laughs> a mutt baby. <laughs> he wanted to uh, make sure that some of the old skills of the uh, of his people didn't get lost. He wanted to pass them down to another generation. So he taught me tracking and na- nature observation, survival. Uh, a lot of other stuff. Taught me how to make whiskey out of corn and potatoes. Um, uh oh. <laughs> he wanted to do insurance. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. His reasoning for that on the the whiskey making, he's he said, if the world ever goes to pot like it did when I was young, and you're pressed to make a living, people are always going to need their hooch. Whether it's right yep. or wrong, people are going to need their hooch, and if you can provide it, you'll stay fed. Yep, makes good logic, makes good sense. Uh, uh, very much so. Uh, Dan, the man, since we've been out here, that's all he's been concerned about because things are looking pretty rough in the country right now, and he, he he's trying to come up with several different ideas on how to survive if uh, things go straight to hell like it's going, and hope it don't. I pray that it don't, but, you know, you, uh, it's always be prepared. I mean, don't don't uh, depend on others when they're sitting there telling you, hey, I've got your back. No, they haven't got your back. You take care of number one, which is yourself in that situation. But go, go ahead on, uh, Chad. You tell Dan he's got room out there. I'll come out and build him a still if he's that nervous. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I, I, <laughs> I'll pass on the steel thing. <laughs> as long as you pass the jar, that's oh, what we're worried about. <laughs> but, but getting back to Richard and you out in the woods, you was the footman, Richard was home base, and usually home base was in a parking lot of numerous uh, locations that y'all went to together. Right, or out on a dirt road, or... And he uh, he might have been limited in what he could do, but he wasn't limited in interest after that. After he had his first real official sighting down in uh, down there in Forty Foot Hole and Sulphur, after that he was hooked. And anything I found, he wanted to inspect thoroughly when I got back to the van. Well, what happened at the Forty Foot Hole, uh, Ghost? This was in October of 2001, I believe. May have been 2000. When the older you get, the the less dates matter. But uh, right. I uh, I had a friend up from Texas visiting uh, another researcher named Rand Trusty, and he and I had gone out earlier in the day, and we found. A series of tracks in the in the spillway from some activity we'd had the night before, and we cast the tracks and kind of killed the afternoon just hanging out out there trying to figure out what all we had happened to us the night before. And then Richard got out there a little later that night, and this is all in a national park. And at the time, we had a pretty good relationship with the park rangers there, and a Shortly after Richard got out there, one of the park rangers came through. We told him what we were going to be doing, and uh, he blocked off the area for us, blocked off the road so nobody could come in. And that was one of my favorite parts of having a rapport with the rangers, is if we wanted to make sure that it was just us out there, all we had to do was give a couple of them a call, and they'd make sure it was just us out there. Well, that's good. But, uh, not not many people do that. I, I can attest to that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we went down to this area called Forty Foot Hole, and it's called that because of a giant sinkhole in the creek down there. Um, but the area we went was off the creek a little a little bit. There's a parking lot, and then on the other side of the parking lot is a big uh, open pasture, and then. In the center of that pasture is a huge plum thicket, and we'd had a lot of luck with vocalizations out there, and it was 
it was due to the activity we'd had the night before we figured it was probably the area where they were passing through to get to the spillway where we'd had the activity all right so we went out we sat around for a little while and uh Finally, we started getting some some noise coming from over by the plum thicket. What time of the year was this, Chad? This, this was October. Okay. It was. Right. It was. Fruit was October. ripe at that time, or was the fruit gone? The fruit was gone. Okay. But it's still good cover. Yep. Um, but it was October thirtieth, day before Halloween. The reason I remember is because. Rand's father had passed away on Halloween several years before, and he wanted to be gone the next day because he didn't want to be around anybody on that right. day. He He's yeah. kind of like me. He'd rather stick to himself on days with bad memories. Right, right. So we, uh, we started hearing some movement and some calls out in that plum thicket, and... Uh, Rand had a bionic ear. He was listening with it, but you really didn't need it because you could hear everything that was going on with the naked ear. Right. And all of a sudden, Richard just starts cussing. <laughs> was and, this rare for him to do this? <laughs> well, no. Richard had a, had a potty mouth just like me, and we both share the same <laughs> twisted sense of humor. But uh -oh. <laughs> the the way that he was cussing, you could tell that something just threw him for a loop. And we kept asking him, what, what's the matter, Richard? What's the matter? And he just kept cussing. He was weaving a tapestry of depravity that would make any sailor proud. <laughs> and uh, finally we got him calmed down, and he said, you're not crazy. I said, what? He said, you're not crazy. And I rambled off some smart-ass comment. I thought, I'm glad he finally figured that out, but I still wasn't sure what he was talking about. So we pressed him a little more, and he said, I just saw one. Hmm. So we pressed him, started grilling him, wanting to know what he saw. He described a, a shorter one, a juvenile, that had leaned out from behind this tree, was holding the tree with one arm and leaning as far out as he could while gripping that tree. And uh, that was Richard's first full-on sighting. Was well, this during the daytime, the dusk evening, or in the dark? This was probably about 10 o'clock at night. Okay. All right. Was he using uh, any night vision or anything? What was the light source at that time, Chad? The only light source was the moon. All right. But he could actually see the movement. Uh, evidently, they, the tree that the a booger leaned away from, was the background behind it was uh, lighter hewn enough that he could recognize one when he leaned around that tree. Right. He said, and he pointed out the tree that he was talking about, and it was outside the thicket. It wasn't in the the actual plum thicket itself. It was a an oak that was sitting off kind of by itself. And he said that he could see the grass, because there's tall grass in that pasture, about waist high. He could see the grass moving, uh, swaying, and then uh, yeah. and then it wasn't the wind, because there wasn't a whole lot of wind that night. And he described it as he could tell that something was moving through it. And then right. that's when he saw the, the young one peek around that tree, and the lightness of that that tall, dead grass behind the young yeah. one was enough to silhouette it real well where he could see it. Right. See, at times, you know, it, you, you have to paint a picture when, you, you know, people listen to what you're saying because... When, when people automatically say that uh, he saw it at 10 o'clock at night and without the benefit of a flashlight or a, a, a bevient light from a, a halogen light or a lamp or a light pole, it, it's hard to try to get people to understand that you can actually see under certain conditions. And I, I appreciate you explaining uh, that scenario, Chad. 
I'm leery about painting pictures for people because it ends up looking like a Salvador Dali painting. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, you don't have much appreciation for Salvador Dali. <laughs> now, now, explain who in the hell is Salvador Dali. This is an outlaw show. <laughs> Google him. <laughs> <laughs> We never profess have... to be fully educated. <laughs> I'm sure uh, somebody in the chat room saying, I, I don't like to play with dollies. I'm a grown man. <laughs> well, guys, we got about three questions here I'm going to throw at you, and then we'll get back to um, Richard and his sighting that he had. Uh, Moon Swan wanted me to ask you if it's true that you can run faster up a creek than a wild hog. <laughs> Somebody's yeah. picking on you, Dad. <laughs> it's not true that you can run faster up the creek. You have to run across the creek and then run up the bank while your brave, fearless friend is sleeping in the truck listening to Willie Nelson music. <laughs> now you're going to have to explain what happened to you, Chad. <laughs> Well, I'd like to interject here, if I may. Oh, there's Matt. <laughs> I, I, I would like to point out that while the answer to that question could be a yes, really the honest answer is he's almost faster than a wild hog running up the creek. Almost faster. <laughs> almost faster. Well, look, not, 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 I'm glad you showed up, Matt. Uh, there's something I need to say real quick. It's lightning and thundering here to the west of us, so I'm sure this front's going to come over us. And there is a possibility that we will go offline if the electricity goes off. So I just wanted you to be ready in case we do, Matt, okay? Okay. Now, go on with why somebody asked you, could you run faster than a hog? <laughs> 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 uh, a good friend of mine, a uh, tribal brother, close as just about anybody, and I were uh, walking an area in Sulphur called Guy Sandy Creek looking for tracks. This that's guy's the, name. That's the area okay. where you have on your avatar on alabamabigfoot.com where you're kneeling down looking at numerous tracks all up and down a sandbar on this creek. Am I right? Right. There were times we would go out to that creek, and we'd have Rubbermaid tubs, the big ones, full of plaster, and we would run out of plaster before we could cast all the tracks in that creek. Now, yep. remember how hard it is to find Bigfoot tracks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it ain't easy at all, guys. It is in well, sober. <laughs> uh, sober. At one time it was easy in sulfur, but we'll get into that later. Go go with your story, Ted. Soba, which is Choctaw for horse, that's what we call this friend I was out with. Soba and I were walking the creek looking for tracks. And uh he got uh, he and I got kind of pooped and it was a long way back to the truck, so Rather than walking the full length of the creek, we decided to go get the truck, pull it down to another spot, and then walk back to where we left off and finish what we had done. And uh, it would give us a chance to pick up the cast that had been drying along the creek as we went back to the truck. We went back, got in the truck, went down to an area that we call the bog because back off in there is some swampy stuff. It's where Guy Sandy Creek meets Arbuckle Lake, and it, it can get kind of nasty in there. Well, Soba, I guess, was uh, feeling kind of tired since he runs on white man time, and uh, he wanted to take a short nap in the truck while I finished casting some of the tra uh, tracks that we found. I went out and poured the plaster and was sitting on the creek bank waiting for it to dry. And I heard this hog rooting around in the brush back behind me. And uh, I know hogs, they ain't nice, so I decided I'm going to go on back to the truck and wait a little bit, and I'll come back 
when the casts have dried and give him a little time to get out of the area. And I waited about half an hour or 45 minutes and went back down there. And the casts were close, but they weren't quite ready because they were on the creek, you know, and the more moisture, the longer it's going to take that plaster to set. So I sat back down. Well, <laughs> let me back up. On the tr tailgate of the truck was a, a Glock pistol and a uh, hunting knife. Well, you can't dig a cast out of the ground with a Glock pistol, so I took the hunting knife with me instead of the pistol. But I wasn't wearing a belt, so I just stuck it sheath and all in my hip pocket, the knife, right. and walked back down to the cast. They weren't quite ready, so I sat back down on the creek bank and was waiting. And I'd been sitting there just, just a couple minutes, and the tree line behind me just exploded. And I jumped up and spun around, and that hog was coming down the bank at me. I don't know what I did, but he wasn't happy about it. So he's coming, now, he's coming head low, and my first reaction is, well, kick down on his head so he can't get those tusks at you. Keep his head low. So I kicked down on his head, and it worked for about three kicks. And, uh, <laughs> then he come up, and ripped my shirt in half, just shredded it, and went back down. We're, and come we're up not talking pin. about we're not talking about a little hog, are we? No, we're not talking about a big pig. We're talking about a big old fat hog. <laughs> he was big, and he come back up that second time. And I have a pair of knee-high lace-up moccasins, and right. at the time. This was shortly after I'd been hit by the car, so I was wearing a knee brace also. Yep. And when he come back up that second time, he hooked my leg. But one tusk hung in the metal bar on the side of that brace, and the other tusk tangled in the laces of my moccasin. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and he ripped that leg out from under me, flipped me on my back, and I rolled over on my stomach, got up on my hands and knees to try to get up and run, and he head-butted me. Honest to God, head-butt, because he slammed his head into my butt. And uh, my whole left leg went numb. Just, bam, it didn't work. And I flopped back over on my back, and he was on top of me then. So I reached up with one arm and grabbed him by the ear to try to keep his head at an angle where he couldn't get them tusks at me. And to a degree it worked. It was <laughs> to a degree painful. <laughs> the harder I pulled, the more it pulled me over and kept me at an angle where he wasn't hooking me with the tusks. But every time he shook his head, he was digging a wallow in the ground with my back. Oh, man. Who well, said that... Big footing was easy. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I reached in my back pocket and grabbed that knife, but I couldn't get it out of the sheath because my other hand was busy keeping me from getting gutted. Yep. So I started stabbing him in the eye with that knife in the sheath, which wasn't doing anything but pissing him off. <laughs> you were just poking him in the eye. <laughs> he was slamming me on the ground, swishing me from side to side, and Finally, his ear came off in my hand, and he didn't he didn't think that was real comfortable. So he backed off just a second, long enough for me to jump up and run. And I've often talked about it. I talk about it to anybody that has known me for any amount of time. I have this Rolodex of useless crap in my head, <laughs> and it started flipping. Uh -oh. And I thought, well, if I run up the creek, my big old paddle feet are going to slow me down, and his little hooves are going to cut right through it like butter, and he's going to catch me and kill me. Right. But if I run across the creek and go up that other bank, I might can get away. So I ran across the creek and up the bank, and there was a downed log on the bank, and I 
kind of hurled myself over it, and he stopped at the log, and I kept a hooking. And I got <laughs> within a few yards of the, the truck and just collapsed. My legs quit working. My lungs were on fire. Everything bloods just, everywhere, bloods everywhere, and sore was in there snoring, correct? <laughs> <laughs> With the air conditioner on. With the air conditioner, <laughs> I'm laying there, one nostril underwater in the creek, one nostril out. So I'm getting half clean air every time I try to gulp in a breath. And finally, I drag myself up the bank and flop down on the tailgate, which woke him up and kind of pissed him off because I woke him from his nap. And he comes around to check on me or to talk to me, and. There I was with my clothes hanging half off and uh, big gashes and everything, except me. He never actually got me very good. He put a scratch on my thigh, and that was it. So, but, now, uh, so now everybody knows the answer to that question. What was the question again, and what is the answer again? If it's true that he can run faster up a creek than a wild hog. <laughs> and the answer is no, but I can run faster across the creek than a wild hog. And uh, she had also asked about the time that you picked up Skunk and Bob McDowell and went back to the plum thicket and you had to get them in your truck and all of the howls and the monkey chants. She wanted you to talk about that one, too. That was that time Keith was down there with us and they all went walking back on the trails through the campground. I had to go get them in the Explorer. <laughs> you that was your story. You tell it. Well, it wasn't my story. Uh, that was just more or less their story. You just should have seen the looks on their faces. Uh, mm. They called me, or they called somebody on a cell phone and said, you know, we're headed back up the trail. Come get us. They're following us. <laughs> And I go down there in my Explorer, and uh, we pick him up there at the trailhead where the gate's at. And as soon as my car pulls up and they open that door, the woods just came alive with monkey chants and howls and screams and everything else. And th Those guys had an interesting walk, I'd say. This, is, this all is at Sulphur, Oklahoma, too, correct? Yes. Yeah. That's uh, right down there by the plum thicket where uh, Richard had his first sighting. At one time, this was a great area to go to, but unfortunately since then they've done a lot of uh, urban development around there, and it's not urban. They're not building houses. They just got rid of a lot of habitat around down there that was cover to the creatures like Bigfoot or boogers, whatever you want to call them in that area. And uh, it, they just come in there. They, they could not control them so they just decided let's uh get rid of their habitat so they had to go on well, well guys was did, were they more likely to be vocal down there in sulfur than anywhere in a lot of the other different places that you know we all have been i can honestly say that in all the places i've been i never got more bang from a buck than i got down there in sulfur and it's not yeah. just because i spent more time there they're bold down there, and they will. Yeah. They'll talk to you. Um, well, what's so unique about that certain location, in your opinion, Chad, that uh, draw them in? Could it have something to do with the mineral water coming out of the ground? Explain a little bit, a uh, little about the history of Sulphur, Oklahoma. The uh, the area was made, I don't want to say famous, but I guess that's the closest word I can find, it was made famous by the mineral water there that comes bubbling up. It, it's all uh, fed by the Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer, which feeds underground from the Rockies, and it all bubbles up there in the park. Um, the Indians and the early settlers both believed very much in the healing powers of the water there. Uh, the uh, the town just kind of built up around it because of the springs. The right. A lot of people, built. a lot of people would come there to bathe in the healing. Uh, it soothed a lot of them's mind, thinking that 
it would cure a lot of eels due to it being a mineral, more sulfur-based type water. Am I right? Right. And one thing I can say about the water is the, the water there in a couple of the springs, if you drink that water and you drink it regularly, the, the pests can smell it in your sweat. Right, so come through the pores spouse. of your skin. Right. Yeah, so can your spouse, and you won't be real popular in the bedroom. But <laughs> the pests... Do you, think, do you think that may have been one of the main reasons why these uh, creatures were hanging around there? That's one of the reasons. Because, uh, I mean, when you're covered in hair and you live in the woods, keeping ticks and mosquitoes off of you is a big plus. Right. But... The other thing that keeps them there is it's a national park, but it's not a well-known national park. And while there's a lot of campers through there, uh, they don't really tend to venture off into the thicker places there in the park. But it's, right. it, it, the campers provide a food source. Right. Well, what, what's the basic vegetation around there? Of course, it being mineral-type water, you know, I don't think a lot of uh, hardwood-type trees would grow there. It would be more uh, plant life that uh, don't have to sink their roots so far in the ground. Could you give a brief description of the uh, plants around that particular area? That area is a... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Matt? It's a transition area. Yeah. It, it, it's, it borders several different types of ecosystems right there all together. That's where they converge at. There's grasslands. There's, uh, uh, there's deep canyons out there. There's uh, forest. It, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's mountains. It's forest. It's grasslands. Uh, but you are right about the types of tree. Uh, it certainly did support the evergreens a lot more than it did anything else. But that's also because uh, uh, of how intrusive some of them are and how they just take over. But um, a lot more cedars than it was anything else when you're talking in regard to evergreen type trees, correct? Right. Right. And the, uh, uh, tell, tell a little bit about uh, these boogers and uh, cedar trees. Uh, you, you've done a lot of studying and observing and looking at areas like this. Now, what, what is the advantage to some an area like this loaded down with thick uh, cedars whose brows would come all the way to the ground like a canopy underneath it around the trunk area? There's several... Uh, advantages to it. One would be if you look at the basic general shape of a Bigfoot and then you look at the basic general shape of a young cedar tree, there's not a whole lot of difference. It's You're talking about like in silhouette, correct? Correct. Yep. And it's not hard to just become a cedar tree. In other words, the boogers out there use the uh, shape probably. This is all uh, speculation and conjecture, correct? But they they conformed to use it as a form of camouflage. Right. Another advantage to the cedar trees is, like you described, the boughs go dip down and touch the ground, form a big uh, open cavity inside. It's a good place to sleep. It's a good place to weather snowstorms. Uh, in Rain fact, I remember, I remember reading an article in an outdoors magazine several years ago about a little boy who survived a blizzard, seven-year-old boy who survived a blizzard by going up under a cedar tree because he'd seen the rabbits do it. Right, right. People don't realize, yes, you're still going to get wet underneath a cedar tree, but uh, I, the way I hunt, I deer hunt quite a bit. I have more so in the past than I have in my later years in life. But uh, 
if you get caught out in the middle of the woods, because I would get way out in the middle of the woods and one of these flash storms would come up or a rainstorm come up, of course, get your gun, move it somewhere else because uh, the metal off your gun conduct electricity. But I'd always get up under a cedar tree, and I would not be as soaking wet as I would if I was under any other tree because the brows, uh, it's kind of like a teepee-type formation, am I right? It, 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 just, uh, it shelters the water off of you and I'm, to a certain if, degree. If you think about the snow aspect, it's... It makes a snow cave without any of the work. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, oh. Another advantage to cedar trees is mosquitoes Ooh. won't go around cedar trees, and neither will tree frogs. So it cuts down on the noise, and it cuts down on the pests. And that's because of the, the what's the word I'm looking for, the... I'm going to say the uh, the sap and acidic level in it. Not that's not really the words I'm looking for, but the uh, the pungent odor and all of that from the sap and everything. It keeps the it keeps the bugs and the the tree frogs from coming around them. Well, um, this might uh, we have a question. Shane had asked a question, and and uh, maybe you could see if you've seen any of this down there. Uh, he had said, had you ever heard of any reports of Bigfoot with cat eyes? With cat eyes? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I don't remember hearing any reports of them uh, having cat eyes. I was always, the, the ones that I saw and the ones that were always described to me were almond-shaped eyes, and they were always dark could barely see any white if you could see any at all yeah right and you and you've seen several pretty close and so you can attest to that personally right um an, another aspect of that sulfur area that keeps them there is uh while the campers provide a food source there's nobody nobody in that park from about November till the next March or April. Nobody. Right. Uh, hunters will go out to certain parts of it, but the park is very limited on where you're allowed to hunt. Right. So they can kind of control who is in and out of that park, and what's amazing about this, it being a seasonal type thing, in other words, uh, uh, Bigfoot could pattern activity due to seasonal change. Right. I hope y'all can hear me. I'm outside. It is really storming now, and I hope we don't lose electricity in the house. It is I, hailing, actually. <laughs> yeah, I agree. We can hear it. It is pouring down. I'm just hoping that we it just rains and moves on and we don't lose any power. But we're just going to continue on until whatever, whatever. <laughs> a question was asked of me earlier, and I didn't really touch on it much. Uh, one of y'all asked me if I vocalized a lot there. Yeah. And yes, yes, they do. Um, and we, we found that depending on which area of the park you were in, you could expect different types of vocalization. It's almost as if each family unit communicated in a different way so that there wasn't cross-contamination between the two family units when they were talking to each other. Hello. Yeah. Hey, we're here. I'm just trying to hear past the hail hitting this <laughs> vehicle in the yard. We I are in Oklahoma Tornado Alley, by the way. <laughs> I, well, the storm thing went off, and I had to mute the phone real quick and go turn that off. So, <laughs> welcome yeah, to we're Oklahoma. Out, we're out here where Steven Spielberg filmed Twister, so that <laughs> ought to tell people what we're up against. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I had a question I was wanting to ask, and I, it flew right out with this storm going on. Um, yeah, um, we had been down there. We had never really gotten to hear uh, the vocals. 
like I'm, that y'all have gotten to hear. And I also wanted to get back to you telling about uh, Richard's uh, sighting. Richard's uh, Richard's sighting. The the entire encounter didn't end with Richard seeing that young one, right? Yeah. Um, we all then spotted some movement in the thicket itself. Um, we couldn't pinpoint what it was, but there was something big moving through the thicket. Well, uh, my gun ho buddy Rand decided that we should go out there right in the middle of it and see what all was going on. I like somebody put a pair of tennis shoes in the water. <laughs> oh, that is hail sitting outside. <laughs> well, we went out into the thicket and had a had a spotlight shotgun. I had a flashlight Um Hold on, guys. I think we're losing Chad, aren't we? No, huh? No. We thought we had lost you. Have you, you, you took? We thought you might have took off uh, for Kansas. <laughs> well, I, I'm in the car. I know where the ditch is at. And I, when I start seeing the foundation of your house start rocking, y'all, every man for themselves. You can forget it. I'm a Mississippi boy, and it's getting bigger and worse, as you can hear. Yes, it you is, don't know how to handle this Oklahoma weather. It is. It's kicked up even more. Well, oh. rest assured, I'm looking at the radar. It's going to pass right through. There's no tornado. There's no rotation. It's just a thunderstorm. <laughs> oh, man. This is cool. We're having our show, and y'all are getting to be in the storm with us. <laughs> 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 well, what what time mark are we getting to the show? I hope everybody can hear me over this maelstrom. Oh, we're getting about to the top of our hour, so we might as well go and jump on into that. And um, I would like to uh, tell everyone we'll be taking calls after the, the song. And let's see here, our call-in number. Give me just a second, guys. It's kind of got me a little rattled here. Um... Our call-in number is 347-324-5347, and I'll put that up in the chat for you. And I would also like to remind everyone that hasn't done so or would like to, to uh, check out our Facebook and our MySpace pages. The links are located on our show page. And um, let's see here. Let me get this put up for you guys. There's the call-in number. And um, I'd like to do a shout out also to everyone that is in our chat room with us tonight. Uh, we have Rifle and Tree Faller, and we have Bob Dominguez and Watch One and Henry May. Thank you, Henry. We do appreciate you. And we have uh, Truth is Out There, Miss Kathy. Hello. And Grave Secrets and Campfire Shadows, which is Shane McMahon, and y'all be sure and tune in to Shane's show on Wednesday nights at 9 o'clock. And we have Gigi, and let's see here. We have, uh, goodness, Moon Swan, North Dakota Terminator, John, our friend up there in North Dakota, and he said he, I think they still have like three foot of snow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and John West and Creek, and we'd also, I'd like to thank Creek for that wonderful intro he done for us. He's Great job, Creek, and it's a, just a great intro. And Cryptic Squatch, our own Evelyn Daly, good buddy friend Evie, Scott Smith, Booger King, Derek, Long Island Yeti, Cryptid Hunt Radio, Jordan, and Jordan has his show on on Sunday or Saturday afternoons at, uh, I think it's 5. Jordan put in that information, and also Henry put in your information for your shows too, and also you too, Shane. And we have uh, Dan, <laughs> Shannon Avalon, and uh, that's all we have in here tonight, folks. And I'd like to welcome all of you, and thank you for being here and supporting me. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Bear now. All right. Uh, we'd like to add with that thank you the AlabamaBigfoot.com, uh, Mike McLean, our good friend, 
Uh, he has a stand-up hell of a forum over there, and uh, he promotes all Block Talk radio shows with a newsletter. And uh, we sincerely appreciate that. And if it wasn't for good people like him and Mike Kellen, Bob Coyne, Shane, Henry May, others like them, um, the uh, spreading of uh, research and uh, information about Bigfoot would not be easy. Uh, I was at I've been a member of this community since 2000, and I think Blog Talk Radio is one of the best medias out there about getting information out. <clears throat> we also have a fan appreciation deal on our forum. What we're doing is you have two ways to enter it. We, we normally will try to keep track of the people who come into uh, – uh, Bigfoot Outlaw Radio's chat room, so your name automatically goes into the hat. And, and it's well that we have people for their own personal reasons who uh, come into the chat identified as guest number so and so and so and so. But it would probably be to a lot of you guys' advantage to actually uh, register with Blog Talk Radio and uh, come in under an anonymous name so that you can participate in something like this. If you choose not to, that's your prerogative. Uh, we don't have a problem with that. We still appreciate you as a listener, whether you come in here under a name or not. I'm still out here fighting hell. But uh, <laughs> then the other way is uh, we recommend if you would like uh, to have your name put in there maybe one or two times, to go to our MySpace page or our Facebook page or the Alabama Bigfoot uh, forum or our Blog Talk Radio uh, chat page and register. And you, that will automatically put your name in the hat. The 1st of May, which, uh, well, the 3rd of May, uh, we're going to have our first draw drawing for a fan appreciation gift, and I'll guarantee you that it will be one worth uh you uh, doing uh, registering for uh, it, it's not going to be something cheap and it's not going to be something that's just impersonal it, it's going to be well worth the time and effort uh, as Shasta said uh, after our intermission and break uh, we're going to start accepting phone calls our number is 347-324-5347 tonight's entertainment uh, for the break it's a real good one, guys. It's a old boy I know from uh, Bamberg, South Carolina, named David Cooler. David's musical inclination got its start beginning with his first guitar given to him by his parents when he was only 13 years old. He is a totally self-taught musician, and he released his first uh, CD on an independent label in 2004. This CD sold out of its release, especially within his uh, Carolina neighborhood. He writes storylines of our lives and plays them with passion and purpose. He sings songs that tell the stories of the good old days and of life as it used to be and when everything was carefree and fun. We was all poor, but we didn't know it, but we was happy. His music spans several genres, and his stories churn out a southern rock music mix, which has a country rhythm and blues and bluesy-type style. David is open for such stars as Rodney Aikens, and he was voted of the Carolinas Music Awards Male Country Artist of the Year for 2008, just last year. He entertains local southern rock and country music fans about three times a week in Orangeburg, South Carolina, and the surrounding areas when he's not booked for other venues elsewhere. Check out this old country boy and give him a whirl. I can promise you it'll be well worth it. That was David Cooler now from uh, Bamberg, South Carolina. You guys give him a listen. I'm sure Shasta put his website up. Uh, I'm proud of all my old buddies who have uh, given me permission to use their songs, and I've got many more surprises in the upcoming weeks, and I hope to continue it on. Now, Shasta, would you care to tell everybody who do not know what a pudding potty is? How many of y'all out there know what a pudding potty is? 
It's when your mama used to fix uh, homemade cakes, homemade anything, and you and the other kids in the family were fighting over the pot. Who got to clean out the pot? That's a pudding who pot. Got, who got to clean out the pudding pot? I'm not going to ask Chad if he ever peed on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> I did that during the first half uh, first half of the show, <laughs> and he lives in Tulsa town. <laughs> y'all want y'all want to hear country to the bone? I'm laying on my bed with a black and tan coon hound smoking cigarettes right now. How's that for country? <laughs> That's pretty good. As country. long as long as he ain't kissing that black and tan in the mouth, we are all in good shape. <laughs> uh, as I a, I had promised Rifle I would ask you this question. He was wanting me to ask you, Bear. He said, when are you going to get up enough nerve to come to Texas and meet some outlaw Bigfoot? Well, we are planning on a outing in Texas at, uh, in the next season. Our, our season starts October until possibly May. It gets in the south, the vegetation gets too rough. The uh, insect life gets too rough. There's too many variables that hurt you when you try to do too much uh, that you like to share with everybody because you got a lot of misidentification and everything else. I love, we was discussing it today. We are planning an outing around a rifle's location around uh, probably early November. Uh, and this is just uh, speculation right now, but we're working on it and uh, looking very much forward to it. Uh, <clears throat> like to welcome back uh, Chad Scott. He's not only our host, but uh, tonight's guest. Uh, we're having, uh, in my opinion, a uh, damn good show. Uh, I'm enjoying it tremendously. I hope everybody else is. I hope everybody in the uh, chat room uh I'd like, I'd like to uh, thank them all for uh, sharing their uh, Easter Sunday with us, and uh, I'm ready to get back to the topic before we run out of time. Time sure flies when we're having fun. <laughs> well, we must take care of our callers, and we have one on the line right now. Henry May, are you out there, darling? <laughs> Henry? You got him off mute? Yes, I do. Oh, we must have lost him then. Henry, are you there, bro? It, call her on well, the air. If he, he, if, he, if he finds us in the meantime, just interrupt us, Henry. <laughs> I mean, just step on in there. Next week, I... Oh, am I... Work. Okay. There I'm probably on the line now. Yeah, yeah here I am. <laughs> I had to Henry. click the allow... I had to click the allow button. He was I'm here, to interrupt Mickey. us is all. <laughs> <laughs> How y'all doing? Doing good, happy, brother. What about you? And happy Easter. Happy, happy Easter, Easter everyone. to you, Henry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um we had some bad storms come through here the other night. We we actually we actually have a tornado alarm in this town. I didn't even realize it till the other night. I mean, they just put it in not too long ago. That's a hell of a way to discover that you got one, ain't it? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I was well, anyway. just going to tell everybody that next week's show for you is going to be a special show. I'll let you explain it here in just a second. We next week be coming on at a special airtime. We will be on 7 Eastern, 6 Central for next week's show due to the fact that we didn't want to uh, step on Henry's feet too much with his special show. So next week, I'd like everybody to make note of this. We, uh, we're going to help Henry out. Henry's helped us out tremendously in a lot of things, and we appreciate it tremendously. So we don't mind changing our start time next weekend to 7 Eastern, 6 Central uh, for Big, uh, Bigfoot Outlaw Radio. And uh, tell us who you're going to have as guests next week, Henry. Well, I sure appreciate that, uh, guys. Um, oh, I got a great show for you guys. Uh, next week, starting at 8 Eastern, 7 Central, we will have the organizers of the upcoming event called the Bigfoot Roundup, which is honoring Bob Gimlin out at uh, Yakima, Washington. Uh, I'm going to have Tom Yamarone singing Tom Yamarone. Um, I'm going to have uh, Paul Graves and James Fay, also known as Bobo. And for those of you who have not heard Bobo tell stories, he tells some great stories. So it's going to be a real treat. 
Y'all are really going to enjoy it. Looking yeah, that's a good to lineup it. you got there, Henry. Yes, it is. And that'll be two, a two-hour show, by the way. Great. Yes, we, Looking forward to it. As soon as our show goes off the air, Henry, we will be there, brother. That sounds good to me, guys. Um, anyway, let's see. As far as um, plus, the Ohio conference is coming up about two and a half weeks. Uh, Don, I just had Don Keating on the show last week. Um, he's going to have Diane Stocking, Billy Willard, and the producer of Monster Quest, Doug Heichick. Sounds like it's going to be a great least, convention. He tentatively, he's tentatively scheduled to speak in Ohio, so. Great. We'll be looking forward to hearing about what all happened up there. I've heard Don yeah. puts on a really good conference up there in Ohio. Oh, he does. He really does. He puts on a real wingding of a uh, conference, for sure. Anyway, I wanted to ask guest, uh, that's uh, Chad, I wanted to ask him if he's ever experienced, um, if he's ever gone outside and heard wood on wood. I've, I've, had, I've actually heard wood on wood a few times, especially after dark. I've heard it a couple of times after dark. I was like, you know, there couldn't be somebody hammering outside this late. In answer to your question, yes, I've, I've heard wood knocks. Um, I, I was asked a question the other night um, through an email what I thought the wood knocks meant. And uh, I, the answer to that question was I don't know. But I, one of the things I told that, uh, the person that asked me was that sometimes when I've been out with, uh, with groups, and people have said, well, I just heard wood knocks. What I heard certainly didn't sound like wood knocks. It, certain, it sounded like chest slaps to me. But to cut back and answer your question solidly, yes, I have heard wood knocks. And uh, I've heard them at night, and I've heard them in broad daylight as well in areas where there shouldn't be anybody but me out there. Wow. Hey, one thing about it is, the, the the first time I heard wood knocks around here, my mother had heard them about uh, a few hours before I did. She heard them before sunset. I heard them late at night. So it 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 would it, would, it wouldn't have been so it it wouldn't have been all that um it wouldn't have been all that not mundane had it only been me that heard them. But my mother heard them too. So. I don't know if it's a Bigfoot or not. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to say it was a Bigfoot because I didn't actually see anything. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really big on that mentality. If I didn't see Bigfoot do it, I don't automatically credit Bigfoot with it. Um, right. And there's a lot of people out there that, as soon as they hear something, that they can't automatically explain the first thing they say is, oh, well, that was Bigfoot doing that. Or they hear a coyote howling in the distance, and that was a Bigfoot. That owl that just hooted over there was a Bigfoot. No, man, nine times out of ten, that owl that just hooted is an owl. Mm -hmm. That coyote that just called is a coyote. And that wood knock you just heard, it very well may have been a Bigfoot, but it also may have been a limb falling out of a tree or... Uh, a, a buck hitting an antler against a tree or beaver slapping its tail in the water. I, I'm real big on not giving Bigfoot credit for everything. I'd mm -hmm. also like to kind of add something Go to ahead, that. Uh, a lot of people um, listen to the show. They listen to this show. Uh, we don't credit everything that happens to Bigfoot. Bigfoot is our last possibility. We go through the list of all the possibilities before we ever get any close to it might have been a Bigfoot. But what we do is whenever we talk about Bigfoot, we'll talk about things that we encountered during our outings. And just because we're talking about them doesn't mean we're saying it was a Bigfoot. If we say we heard a wood knock, that doesn't mean, oh, well, every time they go out in the woods, they hear wood knocks. No, it just happened whenever we were out there looking for Bigfoot. Yeah. Very good. Point. I got you. I got one more question, and I'm gonna then I'm gonna get off the line. Um, 
I have I, I've, been, I've always I've always been curious and interested in the uh, phenomenon of uh, the glowing eyes, so to speak. The supposed glowing eyes, where people claim that they see eyes glow without a light source hitting them. What is your opinion on that? My opinion on that is uh, I'm not going to tell somebody they're full of it because I've seen some pretty strange stuff, but I'll say that I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any eyes that were self-illuminating when I was out in the woods. Well, a lot of right. people would a lot of people would tend. Uh, it's the way you phrase a lot of things at times, Henry, that causes a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, you know, I understand what you're talking about when you mention eye glow, but the novice or the person who's not used to going out in the woods and uh, encountering or seeing anything like this. They're sitting back in their chair listening to the show, and the first thing they say, hmm, so it radiates a glow. That's not what you're asking. Uh, it is a glow compared to, you know, an uh, uh, average eyeball. Uh, you know, you can get more of a picture of it if you spotlight or put a flashlight on any animal, a domestic animal will do, in the dark. You will get a, because what's happening is you're getting a reflection back off the light source that's hitting it directly in the eyes. A lot of times I'm thinking when people say I shine or I glow with no light source available, they're, they're thinking, well, huh, so uh, their eyes are just casting out a beam. That's not what you're talking about. I've seen Bigfoot on the perimeter of uh the deer camp that I stay at uh, back home in Mississippi, they'd be right outside the halogen beams that, of the uh, vapor lights in the uh, deer camp's parking lot. And I, I do know that for it to be able to see in the dark, it has to open its eyes as wide as it can to receive all the obedient or the surrounding light source uh, it would kind of cause a glow-type effect. I've never really myself seen what a lot of people describe as its eyes was glowing like a demon from hell. And when you start talking that way, the first uh, p vivid uh, <coughs> picture you get in your mind is that it has a light source that's making it brightly glow like the tail lights of a car. That's not the way it works. It's just that their eyes at night, for them to be adapted or evolutionarily adapted to see with, they have to extend their eyelids in a more, well, basically like an owl, uh, a, a night bird that can see in the dark. Uh, it has to open its eyes fully extended to uh, try to be able to see. And I think a lot of times, even the moon and bright starlight because a lot of people don't understand this either once you get out in the woods and in the middle of the night with no uh, light sources around no city lights or nothing uh it, it's real bright out there unless it's a cloud covered night and uh, of course then it's dark as hell but uh i think a lot of times their eyes uh, being fully extended will catch the obedient light source, whether it be the moon or the stars, and it would give it a semi-glow effect. Let me, right. let me throw in on that bear and dumb it down a little bit for people. Just because you're not holding a flashlight on them, just because your headlights aren't in their eyes, or just because they're not standing under a street light, doesn't mean there's not a light source. Right. Now, yeah. yeah, you're talking about stars and the moon and things right. of that nature, correct? Yeah. Correct. Well, guys, I don't want to hurry you along, but we've got several callers on the line. Okay. Oh, no problem. <laughs> That's pretty much all I wanted to ask anyway. Thanks very much, uh, guys, and great show tonight. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate it, Henry. No problem. See, talk to you all later. Bye-bye. All right, man. Okay. Caller... Caller 214, you're on the line. Uh, hello. Hello. Hey. Bob. Hey, this is Bob Dominguez. I wanted to call in first say a uh, great show, and I wanted to say hello to my uh, brothers, uh, Chad, Matt, and Bear. 
<laughs> Why you Bob Dominguez. Uh, Dad, you know Bob Dominguez? Never heard of him. Never heard of him. Isn't, isn't that that lion and hoaxing piece of... Yeah. That? That's who that was. <laughs> all right, don't <all> right. <laughs> sure. It's great to hear from you, Bob. I, I, I miss you, man. And when uh, you man, move, uh, oh, when you move to I Oklahoma, got, I'm sure we'll see each other quite more often. Yes, sir. I got I got to get back in the woods, chef. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, I'm I've been jonesing for it. We're gonna get Bob on the show before too long. Yes, we are. We're going to have Bob on the show. we got to uh, get him over his stage, right? But this this man has been in research. How many years, Bob? Oh, maybe. I think it, um, this is going on my uh, ninth year. Yes, sir. Ninth year mm -hmm. when uh, I used to be back with a group in Texas. I'm not going to say which group it is, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead. There's a lot of groups in Texas that we don't want to declare. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, isn't it amazing a person can be in Bigfoot research for nine years and not accomplish a damn thing? <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of my life. <laughs> but anyway, guys, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hold up the line. I just wanted to call and say, uh, great show, uh, Chad, and you know, Chad's a great guy. I mean, I, I, every time I go in the woods with him, or any time I re like research with him, I'm always learning something from him constantly. So he's good people. Like like we say in the, the hood here, he's uh, good peeps. So uh, word, yeah. I just wanted to say uh, thank, thanks for taking my call, and I'll uh, I'll hang up and let someone else uh, call it. Bob, you are you Bob? Are you saying you have never peed off a porch? <laughs> Man, more times in uh, Lamar County and uh, Kimichi and Hopkins County, Delta County. I've done that lots of times, just not in Dallas County. <laughs> it's good to hear from you, Bob. You All right, brothers. Be good, man. Good show. Bye. Okay, let's see here. Caller two. Caller two oh eight. You're on the line. Uh, is that me? Yes, yeah, sure. you. We can hear you. But guess who this is? There, oh. North Idaho. Cindy is this Frey. Cindy? Hey, yes, it is. This is Cindy who? <laughs> oh, I can't find my last name. There's my BMW. Well, I think this is a record, folks. That's back-to-back -back calls from Mexicans. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. see, it was just a matter of time. I was waiting. I Well, I have dial-up, and I finally got on, and then I seen I could call in. So I hopped on up, and I got off that crappy connection, and I called in. I, I actually didn't know I could hear the hear it while I was waiting, so that I, that's why I um, didn't think I, you know, I'd bother calling in, but I'm glad I did. Oh my gosh, I miss you guys so much. You may Cindy. miss me. This is the Red Hot Chili Pepper. Yes. Is Cindy Lulu? Yes. Cindy. Oh we'll God. figure it out in about 10 more minutes who it is. <laughs> Y'all hear that? She hit 14 points in 12 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, Cindy. Yeah. Cindy, what tribe are you? Oh Lord! You have to you have to tell him that joke another time. Uh, We're on the air, you know. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to fly down this November. So you just keep me updated. I've been I'm just busy up here, you know, just life and stuff. But um, I've had some pretty amazing experiences in 2004. And I'll tell you what, I I've seen one track up here, and it was three tow tracks. And I can't even tell you how many people argue that one on with me. Up here in the oh, Pacific yeah. Northwest. Right, right. Well, we, we, nobody's perfect, baby. I'm not calling all Pacific Northwesters that way. It's just that I, I heard a statement the other night. Me and Dan was watching TV, and uh, it was a scientist on TV. And you know what blew my mind, what he said? He said, I would not be a good scientist to my profession if I did not have an open mind. Right. And that really just blew my mind. <laughs> I bet he's not a scientist this week. <laughs> that's what I'm wondering, you know. I mean, how can you be a scientist and, uh, you know, have an open mind, but yet when certain subjects come up, they run like hell. <laughs> it just blows my mind. <laughs> well, and he's, greeting, um, he's greeting people at Walmart this week. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to tell you, you know, this, this is, 
you know, life from Texas to up here is just such a drastic change, and you know, it, it's just like Montana, and you know, just up the road, you know, we we got like black bear and you know, just mountain lion, and you know, they come right here in my backyard, and I'm up in the mountains, and so I'm, you know, kind of I've had some neat experiences, um, but I, you know, again, I don't want to tie up the phone lines. Maybe another time I can uh, tell you of some of them. But those were back in 2004 and five. Lately, you know, it's been a little bit more different now. I, but I have to tell you something. I honestly believe that they know who I am up here. I've been up oh, these yeah. mountains on horseback. And I'm telling you, you know, they know when you're aggressive and they know when you're not. And they, I honestly believe, too, that they know when you're at peace. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am, it does. And I'd like for... Chad to speak on that, uh, that gives him an opportunity to speak about uh, passivity compared to a hunter type mentality. And hunting does not mean that you're out to harvest any particular game. It just means if you're out there looking for Bigfoot, you're actually hunting it. So uh, should you go into the woods with a hunter mentality or a passive mentality like having being at peace with the woods like you just said would you reiterate on that uh chad i would say I, I, anyone that's known me for any amount of time has already heard my spiel on this but i would say that if you are going to go out and hope to have an encounter you need to go out and hope to have an encounter of anything you need to go to the woods just to go to the woods. Go out to experience nature. Don't go out with the express purpose of, of finding Bigfoot because I can tell you you're not going to find them. And if you do, it's just going to be a fleeting glimpse and you won't see anything else. But if you... It's like you said, Bear. If you go out there with the intent of finding Bigfoot, you've already damned yourself because you've got that hunter mentality where you're out there looking for a specific something and nature can pick up on that. I'm not getting metaphysical here. I'm, I'm just stating simple fact. Nature senses things that we don't. We've blocked that part of our minds and we don't see or hear or sense these things anymore. But nature picks it up. You go out there looking for Bigfoot, looking for tracks, trying to hear something, you're going to miss what is really intended for you to hear. What I mean by that is I call it concentric rings. When you throw a rock into a pond, the ripples reach out and touch every part of that pond. When you go out, when you go out with a more more pure mind, you're just out there to experience nature. You're going to see these ripples, these these effects of other things on the inhabitants in the area you're in. For example, you can tell by what mice are doing if there are foxes around, if there are owls around, if there are any predators whatsoever around. By watching the smallest of things, you learn about the bigger things because they know how to read their entire environment, the entire situation. And if you can read them, you can read that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, I... <coughs> I've always thought that, uh, you know, as soon as people get out of their vehicle, the first thing, if they are aware of it, when they slam their car door, like 80% uh, of the people do, not many people get out into the uh, woods by getting out of a vehicle without slamming their doors. They don't catch the fact that that blue jay or that crow over their head is raising 10 times worth of hell about it. When that blue jay or that uh, crow over your head, or even a simple squirrel, st 
starts barking at you, he just give away to anything in the listening area that a obtrusive intruder has just entered my territory. And if you don't think a booger will pick up on that, you are sadly mistaken. Yes. Let me... Uh, well, guys, I, like I said, don't want to cut into your topic here, and we will get right back to it, but we do have some other callers on the line waiting. Okay. Send them in. Okay, let's see here. We have caller 502, you're on the air. Hello. I'd like to say uh, fantastic show, and uh, I would like to uh, announce that I am Soba, the gentleman who was earlier somewhat... Uh, <laughs> Let's just say that I uh, wasn't made out to be the best uh, tracker or a partner, but uh, some of the small <laughs> details that were left out of the earlier um, <laughs> detail that Chad gave was that to pick up the knife out of the back of the truck before he went to get his cast was he moved to the 45 that we had with us to get the Bowie knife. Um, yes, the, the 45 that I gave to him for safety precautions in case something like that were to happen. Exactly, because earlier he had been run up a tree by a wild hog in that area. <laughs> well, I'm that telling you, 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 you can't dig a cast out of the ground with a 45. <laughs> uh, you, should, you, you, know, you can do it. It's just, you know, Matt probably wouldn't appreciate getting it back that way. <laughs> I, uh, I give Sobo a hard time with that story, but uh, he's been in the thick of it with me several times. Uh out there in the field. He is a good research partner. Um, he knows as well as anybody that knows me at all. Uh, if I like you, I'm going to give you a ration of it. And he got his <laughs> share. Yeah. Of up. Hey, well, don't forget to tell him they did offer you a cigarette once you get back to the truck. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> He's bleeding to death, but he got his cigarette, right? That's it. He was even was right and hacking, and I thought, by God, he must be out. <laughs> you guys got a great show. It was fantastic tonight. Thank we you. We appreciate you coming, Sorba. And uh, no, you're not a, a poor researcher. I thought the only way you did research was to camp out in the cab of your truck and catch all them that sleep that you're losing while you're out there knocking well, around you, on trees and stuff. <laughs> in, in addition, he did mention that he had a knee brace on. So the five miles of creek we walked, I packed all the plaster in and out. So, oh, yeah, I was, I was probably taking a nap. <laughs> yeah, and I, I didn't mention the part where we'd been up till about 4 in the morning because they were creeping in on the campsite all night the night before. <laughs> but it, it makes the story better when I leave out those details. Yeah, he also didn't, didn't mention the land. fact that he didn't mention the fact that I wasn't even there. I was sitting back at camp. Uh, <laughs> at least Soba was there in spirit. <laughs> well, you, did, you did come down to rescue and drive him uh, out of there well, because of course, he wasn't to ride with me. Well, the hero well, does show up at the opportune moment. Who took him to the emergency room? That's all I want to know. <laughs> the emergency room? Chad is from Oklahoma, Bear. Uh, Chad just wanted to go home and change clothes. <laughs> oh, he put a Band-Aid on it. <laughs> yeah, I, I drove him back to the house and, you know, had to keep him awake the whole time because he was passing out going unconscious in my back seat. Um, but now, after bleeding, a shower and a change of clothes, we were right back out there. Yep, bleeding all over your back seat. And, well, yep, sure. Yep, that sounds like Chad. Uh, Hi, what are friends for? Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, before I jump off, or you need to finish that story about the guy with the gray hooded sweatshirt at the campsite when we yeah. were talking to the park ranger. That is a good one. <laughs> I'll jump off here, guys. I appreciate it. I'm going to go listen. Take care, Sobo. We appreciate it. You got to settle up. <laughs> well, you, uh, you got to finish the story now, Chad. Oh, we got one more caller, guys, and then we'll get back to our topics we were on. Let's see here. Let me get him going. I think my connection is slowed. Hey, Bill Green, you on the line? Bill? Hello? Yeah. Bill, are you there? Yep, I'm right here. Okay, thank you for your patience. Yeah, and happy Easter. Happy Easter to you too, Bill. Yeah, um, so any new uh, sightings in uh, your state? 
Well, other than the one that we had told about last week, uh, we haven't had any actual new ones that have occurred this week. I don't know up in uh. Matt and Chad's area. Guys, y'all have anything that y'all heard of up in there? Uh, no, I haven't heard anything lately. No. Yeah, I got a little warning for you guys. Uh, in August, the Georgia hoaxers are back in town again. They're, they're planning on oh. doing something. And I, it's just <laughs> when I saw it, it's just... Uh, <laughs> Well, Bill, why can't why can't those people just give up on us? You know. Well, th this time we can just cut to the chase. It's a costume and a freezer, and we can move on. Yeah, <laughs> I tell you. I wish we could find them packed in a freezer somewhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish we could find well, them in they, a jail cell sometime. Are they still <laughs> running around with Tom Biscardi though? I think they're uh, those those guys uh, fit like a glove. You know, it, it, it all works together. Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I, we don't let it bother us, Bill. We go, well, like I've said once before, even when a lot, of people, even when a lot of people fell for that crap, I was sitting there saying it will not change one thing what I'm doing currently. And what's so cool about it all is, if one is ever really, really, really allowed to be brought out to the public view uh, <laughs> it's not going to make it any easier for anybody else to find a Bigfoot it's not going to make it I mean what's going to happen the day that one is allowed to be brought to the public's attention are they all going to just walk up to their local fire department and sheriff office and turn themselves in and say the gig is up <laughs> it's not going to make it no easier <laughs> well, uh, guys. yeah, nothing, nothing new in uh, Connecticut as far as uh, sightings, but I did find some possible uh, tree twists um, this past uh, week, and uh, and then a camera. You know, I, sometimes I don't bring a camera w with me when I go in the woods because I feel that the wildlife don't like cameras. You know, what I mean, they, I feel to go in the woods and just enjoy the, right the woods. The woods are so relaxing. You know, I mean, when you go in there, and animals are actually come right up to you like they're your next door neighbor. Right, right. You know, well, if never, you bring a camera, I, they look at you and be like, you know, what's your problem? <laughs> well, you know, what what's the use of a camera, regardless anyway? When you got nine hundred people standing out there, I don't care if one come out there posed in a tutu. You got nine hundred people who gonna say that's crap. That's crap. Yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to know who made all these people the judges of the Bigfoot world. What are their credentials to be a judge? I want somebody to show me their credentials. I haven't seen any credentials. Yeah, especially the person they're mentioning in chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to talk about who's in chat. I'm not in front of a computer. I just don't like putting a lot of people down unless they uh, have... Uh, like, I put, like I said, on every show, I don't know that person that well. I talked to him on his radio show once or twice, and but after what after what happened last year, it's just uh, I'm not his buddy or friend. I'm just I correspond with him occasionally just to keep an eye on his movements. You know. I understand, brother. Well, we appreciate you calling, Bill. You're a main yep. to this community. A lot of people like you and uh. We appreciate the time that you uh, spend with us every week, and you just don't know how much. Uh, uh, a lot of people really think uh, real good things of you, Bill. You just keep on doing your own thing the way you want to do it, and as long as you're happy doing it that way, that's all that matters. Yeah, and yeah. I hope more people call the show. Yeah, thanks Thank for you, calling brother. in, Bill. Yep, yeah, bye-bye. Okay, guys, that was all of our callers for right now. And uh, let's see, I think you were supposed to tell that story or re finish telling the story about that guy in the hooded sweatshirt thing, Chad. Matt, you want to lay the groundwork on this one since we were sitting in your tent? <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks come wandering up. <laughs> oh, that one? I don't know if I want to tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> We, well, we can talk about uh, those people. Well, uh, whenever, okay, the, the hog incident happened inside the boundaries of the park. 
and the park has rules. Anytime somebody has a negative encounter with an animal inside the park, they want you to notify the park ranger so they can fill out a report. So we contacted the park authorities, and they sent somebody out, and it was actually um, one of the rangers that's pretty good friends with Chad down there, and she was taking the report at our campsite. Well, well, she was doing the report, this other group of campers, just a, a family group, they had some kind of family gathering going on down the ways a bit from us. A few of them came walking up to her and said that they needed uh, to talk to her whenever she had the chance. Well, she uh, walked on over there to help them, so I thought, you know, hey, this might be a good opportunity to go get something out of my car so I could hear what they were saying. So I went to my car, and uh, I was digging around in there, and what they told her was that they had all come back from uh, being out in the park and walking the trails and everything, and they were sitting around the fire getting dinner ready. Well, over in one of the tents that was kind of down a ways away from everybody by the tree line, uh, they heard noises come from it, and the tent was kind of shaking. Well, at first they didn't think of anything. They thought it was the kids, you know, trying to play a joke and scare them or something. So they just kind of ignored it and sat there a little while longer and went about their business, and they got to looking around, and all the kids were accounted for. Well, the, the, the tent, you know, shook a little bit again, and a few of them walked over there, and as they were approaching the tent, I guess the... Uh, the door flap side was pointing away from them. And as they walked up to this tent, they said uh, a man in an all-white suit, like white pants, white sh hooded sweatshirt pulled up over his head, came running out of the tent and ran off through the woods. And she said, well, did you get a good look at him? No, he was just dressed head to toe in white or some kind of light-colored clothing. And said, well, did he have a flashlight or anything? No, he never turned on a flashlight. He just took off running through the woods, and I just thought what that was... Of, what, what time of year was this, Matt? Uh, when was that, Chad? It was in March. Yeah, late oh, March. Oh, okay. okay. After spring break. All right. Was it, what was the temperature down there? Was it uh, conducive to be wearing sweats like that? Uh, no. Like I said, Soba had the air conditioner on in the truck. Right. Um, so... Yeah, it, it was, then it, it took was off warm. into the woods. Yeah, right. And we're not we're not calling everything Bigfoot though, right? No, no. I just <laughs> just thought it was a little interesting side note. Well, did Chad have anything to add to that? He wanted you to lead him into it. <laughs> he, he pretty much took care of that one. Yeah, I just thought I I'd clean that one up. I want to get back to the concentric it. ring stuff. That's what I want to hear, too. Am I understanding you to say, now, I, I just want to help out the audience and help my own self out here. If you take a pebble, I'm talking about, say, a pea-sized rock, and you threw it into a pool of water, the concentric rings or the ripples off of that rock will gradually make its way to the bank. And then normally it will bounce off the bank and head back towards the center where the original uh, drop was. And then you compare that to somebody that drops a, a big old uh, two or three pound boulder into that same creek. What you're going to have, you're going to have ripples too, but they're going to be more violent. Is, is that what you was uh, trying to get across, Chad? Correct. Um, the more intrusive you are, the bigger those ripples are. The more you're affecting everything in that environment. A lot of people call it the butterfly effect, the butterfly lets a fart in Wisconsin and um, a monk dies in the Tibet, you know, I mean. Right, right. It's all one big, big way of saying that what you do affects everything else around you. Right. This is just in the, we're just speaking in the immediate vicinity of, say, an area that you thought would be conducive enough to go into on the pretense or chance that you might have an opportunity to encounter or see a uh, Bigfoot. Correct. And to give another example, um, I mentioned earlier about reading the smaller things to be able to read the big ones. Right. If you want to know what Bigfoot does in your research area, Look at what the other animals are doing. Look at what other animals are there first. 
um, know the area before you start researching the Bigfoot side of it. For example, if you want to know what Bigfoot's eating, look at the scat of other animals. That'll tell you what what fruits and vegetables are available in that area. That'll tell you what uh, what meat food sources are available in that area. Like uh, uh, coyote scat, you'll find uh, rodents and other uh, small animal bones in it. Um, bobcat, you can tell that the persimmons are in season because you'll find persimmon seeds and bobcat scat. Um, look at what else is there if you want to learn what Bigfoot's doing there. Because in order to support these things, or in order for Bigfoot to be supported, it, these things have to be supported. You're going to find out more if you start at the bottom and work your way up. Yes, you do. Um, I like the example of the concentric rings. It makes sense if, if people would just really kind of think about it. It's so much better to go in and not make a big ripple. You'll, your, your odds, your chances of just sneaking in and making as small of a little ripple as possible <clears throat> would be better than being very intrusive and scaring everything away. Right. Um, leave your baggage at home. Leave all the, the worries and everything else at home. John. Turn the cell phone off. Um, another example. Uh, I mentioned earlier about when you go in and you're looking for Bigfoot tracks and all of this. Bigfoot sign consists of a lot more than tree twists and footprints. If you're looking for tree twists and footprints, you're going to miss the smaller things, the, the little tiny nuances that tell you that something's there that's not a deer, or not a bobcat, not a, a, a coyote. You're going to miss those tiny things that are going to reveal stuff to you. Well, as you're sitting there and you're listening and, and you, you, you've done all those things and you're just, you're just sitting and enjoying the surroundings, you will notice that the other animals that are there with you will give away other intruders that are coming in. And this also includes Bigfoot. Right. Well, well you know, includes, yeah, go ahead, Matt. Well, it, it includes uh, not only Bigfoot, but everything. It's kind of like... You know, the monster movies, you know, somebody will show up and you'll see this crowd of people running the opposite direction. Well, they know which direction the monster's at. Or whenever bear goes hunting and he knows that there's hunters in the area and a buck comes running towards him, he knows which direction the hunters are. It, the right. same principles apply, you just reverse it. Yeah, and plus, you know, you you know, the uh, talking back on what uh, Chad was talking about, you can go into the wood with three attitudes. You can go in there passively without a care in the world, trying not to disturb the envir environment as much as you can, but you can do that too much. Uh, as a hunter, especially, you've got several modes of hunting, which is this is not a hunting show, but a lot of people use a method called stalking. In other words, they'll go into the woods and they'll just... what. I interpret as stalking is different from what a lot of other people do. They'll just go into the woods and looking for uh, how to place their steps and their head is constantly swiveling all the way around to the right and the left. And his demeanor, if I was sitting in a tree stand or was hid uh, over there on the ridge watching him or observing this hunter at the time, and I didn't know what he was doing, all I could do would dictate by his actions that he's hunting for something because he has the demeanor and the physical appearance of somebody that is hunting. And this uh, physical appearance is dictated and understood by wildlife. Uh, it's a demeanor that's thrown off that uh, actually you, you, people are not really conscious of it at the time, but they're giving their uh, motive away by their actions. Uh, another way is... Uh, when you go and force your way into the woods of nature, and I, I'm not talking down to anybody. Uh, normally, people who really, really have a strong desire and want to see a actual Bigfoot, they'll just 
park their car in a, a public park somewhere and go to tromping into the woods. Well, there every footstep is uh, running uh, wildlife in front of it. They they're accidentally pushing game in front of them, which just uh, disturbs everything in the general surroundings to the extent where they get alarmed and start. Uh, vocalizing or physically voicing their displeasure at the intruder in their midst. Well, Bigfoot is attuned to this more than that's that's like Bigfoot's doorbell. And when somebody comes to your house and you're in the back of the house and you didn't hear them pull up, and they come up to your front door and ring your doorbell, that aha, uh -huh, somebody's at the front door. Well, to Bigfoot, when uh, these blue jays or crows or squirrels start barking or deer start running toward them or rabbits or any other uh, game in the vicinity, they know that that was caused by a reason. Something happened to push them into that aspect of behavior. And uh, believe you me, it pays for these creatures to understand they've got to be aware of everything in the woods. And that kind of goes back to what Chad's saying. If Bigfoot uses every animal in the forest to his advantage, why don't we start using these same animals to our advantage? And before somebody starts in with, well, how would Bigfoot know that that's what caused it? Every animal knows when other animals are spooked, and they instantly go on high alert. If you've spent time in the woods around wildlife, you have seen this time and time again. If the crows start cawing, then the squirrels run away. Or the squirrels start barking, and the birds will start flying up into the tree limbs and get off the ground cover. It, it, that's just the way nature works. Okay, guys. Yep. We have a couple well, more callers on the line. Yeah, we need to take them real quick because we, yeah, we haven't got but about, what, seven minutes left in the show? Okay, here we go. Caller 715, you're on the line. Well, listen to all you southern folks. You all sound like <laughs> you think you know something up here. We don't know but, nothing, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> you all a bunch of dang hoaxers, like Dan says. <laughs> uh, I just I just want to come on here and make a, make a comment. Um you know, for anybody listening, um, take take to heart what you learned from Chad, and uh, take a lot of you know it's serious. I mean, this you know going out there isn't all about science, and we need to get out of that that frame of mind of it's all about science and you know looking for the obvious things and you know putting ourselves in that that mode of you know robot mode, if you will. I mean, you know, a lot of what he says. I mean, he's obviously. He's got a real connection. He knows what he's doing. He's been out there. And personally, myself, and not just Bear and Shaft and Dan, but I would go out blind and, and crippled with Chad and probably feel safer than I would in the city street with a couple officers surrounding me, you know, with, you know, heavy firepower. I mean, talking to Chad and, you know, and reading some of the things, uh, you know, he's written and that, I mean, He's got a real heart for it, and you can learn a lot from him. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could do. I've, I've learned from a Native American friend. She's taught me actually how to uh, meditate, you know, before I head out to the woods and even gone as far as using white sage to smudge with to kind of clear your human thoughts, I guess, if you will, kind of get yourself in peace in a mode where you're just peace you're not out there looking you're just out there observing and kind of connecting with nature because you're, you're going to have a lot more enjoyment and a lot more progress I believe if you do it if you get out of that robot mode and that science mode you'll never leave the woods disappointed whether you see a Bigfoot or not that's right that's you you, you go ahead that boils down to a simple a simple question what is your motivation for your research are you going out because you want photographs are you going out because you want tracks or are you going out because you want to have an encounter and experience something completely unexplained in nature what is your motivation for going out 
Absolutely. You know, it's, well, we it's a matter of just... You know, and it's, oh, yeah. you know, the thing I think what a lot of people miss, and and it kind of kind of came to my attention when I was down there with you all down there in uh, Bama and Mississippi and that, you know, there's so much you miss when you're you're so focused on on one thing or one goal. Right. And and it's something I learned from all of you. It's like when you take a step back and you truly truly open yourself up to what's out there and what you can experience. You know, and it it doesn't always have to be about seeing one finding tracks. It's getting back to, you know, nature and and really understanding it and enjoying it and appreciating it, you know, because we only have one life to live. Amen. You know, Amen. You know, li like like I always say, live like you're dying the next day. Enjoy it, appreciate it. Get it, brother. It. <laughs> and, and you know, and 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 I'll tell you something. And, and I, you know, I think you'll a lot of many people learn that from Chad. You know, it's just just be out there to appreciate it. Don't be out there on a mission like you're a robot. Be out there to appreciate right. what God gave you. You know, and you only have one chance to enjoy it. To take advantage of it. You're well, stepping into you're stepping into their world, so you want to try to blend in as well as they do. Right. Yeah. You want to bring in that last caller because we're we're running about three minutes yes, left I do. in the show. Uh, yes, I do. And uh, Shane, you can just hang right there, and I'm going to. Yes, run. stick around, Shane. Uh, All right. Call Howdy, call outlaws. Call you on the air. Outlaws. Howdy. Hey, who's this? <laughs> this is the Creekster. Uh, hey, 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 Creek. Hey, y'all. Hey, Creek. Just wanted to say I love y'all and. Uh, I don't want to take up the last minute of the show, but... Well, I'm glad we was able to get you in. <laughs> yeah. It's been Shane busy tonight. Getting, Shane was getting pretty deep there. <laughs> well, uh, oh, if you guys would just hang on for a second, we're going to finish out our show and uh, yeah. schedule. And we, the rest of this show, if people will come back and download it, it will be picked up in archive. So if you all just bear with us while we finish out this segment, uh, I mean, Next week, like I said earlier, we're going to air at a special time, uh, 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Tim Baker, Kumbo will be on the show. We're going to have a, a lot of discussions about various topics and aspects of Bigfoot. We're not going to, we'll, we'll talk and discuss sightings and encounters, but uh, we, we try with our show, we want them to help people and we're going to do our dead level best to do that. That's a show that people do not want to miss. Please uh, make note of that, that we'll be on here next week at uh, 6 Central Time, 7 Eastern. Uh, Chad, thank you for coming on. Like I said, you're our regular, one of our every other week hosts. Uh, Matt, it was great hearing from you. And I love every one of you guys. Appreciate, appreciate you spending your Easter Sunday with us, and I'll turn it over to Shasta now. All righty, we're done under 60 seconds, so I'm just going to say good night and see you folks all next week. We're out of here. <laughs>
Well, did anybody stay with us? I'm still here. <laughs> Dang, Dang, I thought he'd hang up. Shane? Huh? I thought Chad would hang up. You thought he would? <laughs> yeah. We got his is Creek and Shane still with us? Yeah, they hung up too, I think. Well, hell, if they hung up, we all can go. Guys, I'm proud, I'm proud of you. Great super job. Show. Great super job. Show. Yes, it was. Who's right. saying super? Hey. Is, is Chad still there? I guess they're gone. We're gone. Good night, everybody. <laughs>